So welcome everybody. Uh, this is the kickoff event for um, a, a year-long event series titled Architectures of Transition. And this lecture series interrogates architecture's alliance with the project of carbon modernity from the early moments of industrialization to today's advanced stages of fossil capitalism. But of course, the series is not just about architecture's complicity in climate change. It is um, also about architecture's role in broad organization transition, um, which was unquestionable and problematic in the context of the last energy transition into fossil fuels. However, it's indeterminate and full of possibility as we think about the transition to come. So in that light, I could not be happier to be welcoming Mackenzie Ward um, to this lecture series. Uh, professor Wark is a professor of culture and media at the New School. She's a prolific writer. I cannot uh, begin to list everything that she's written for you, but titles that you will likely already know include Molecular Red, Theory for the Anthropocene, The Beach Beneath the Street, The Spectacle of Disintegration, um, Sensoria, Thinkers for the 21st Century, um, amongst many others. Um, and Professor Wark is someone whose thinking looks both backwards and forward. And um, I find that in writing the question of what comes next is never far from, well, how did we get here? And inevitably asking how did we get here transforms how we think about what comes next. So um, I'm extremely pleased to welcome Mackenzie here today um, so that she can help us to look both backwards and forward in time and help us to think through this mess that we've found ourselves. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back at uh, Cooper Uni. It's been a while. Um, and this um, tries to put together like a few things I've worked on at different times. So there, there are sort of like sub changes in the sort of material that we're going to look at. Uh, and uh, one possible title for it is uh, Architecture is Dysphoric and Wants to Transition. Architecture has uh, a relation to itself and the world. But it's one that causes considerable unease. So let's take architecture at its most rudimentary. It's a structure that creates a stable relation between an interior and an exterior that keeps something out and keeps something in. An architecture subordinates the vector of movement into and out of a particular location to the maintenance of the membrane that separates the inside from an outside. An architecture makes and regulates an interiority. There'll be movement across its membrane, but those movements appear secondary to the persistence of a border. An architecture as an enclosure of an interiority presupposes an exteriority that's greater than it, which it is, uh, but which is to some extent unknown and unmarked. An architecture vets and regulates the vectors across its membrane in either direction, incoming and outgoing. Oops, no, I'll let me shift. Uh, but it must, it's mostly concerned with uh, moments of passage across its perimeter, not the origins or destinations of the vectors that cross it. And yet an architecture assumes this elsewhere exists. The vector comes to its doorstep and leaves by the back door to somewhere else. Uh, that other place has to be there somewhere, but for architecture, it's without qualities. In the root of the word itself, architecture is the motion, notion of some sort of stability. The structure doesn't collapse. My father was an architect, by the way, and that was, that, it was sort of like, the first thing is it doesn't fall down. The second thing is it doesn't leak. You know, he has somewhat, uh, uh, you know, kind of practical approach to it. Would that all architects did that? I'm sorry, but I gotta say it. <laughs> Stands up, doesn't leak. <laughs> all right, so like in the biblical parable, uh, architecture is built on rock, not on shifting sand. It's stable also in this other sense that there's a consistent relation between an interiority and an exteriority. With the added qualification that interiority is specific, located somewhere, has definite capacities to regulate the passage of any vector across its bounds. And that regulation may not be absolute, but it's definite. Whether what flows across, uh, flows along the vector is solid, liquid, or gas, architecture regulates passages across the border of an interiority. It regulates the passage of humans and other forms of life, and also more generally, passages of energy and information. Uh, these vectors come from somewhere and go somewhere uh, before and after passing in and out through the portals. 
but that somewhere can remain unknown. Architecture deals in partial totalities, separated off from a world that only needs to be sort of vaguely addressed. Architecture limits what uh, it knows about exteriority to what it needs to know to ensure a stable relation, a relation that maintains an interiority from which certain forms of life are excluded. It presupposes an exterior where other forms of life exist. The thing that would complicate this in our present environment, obviously, is things like viruses. Uh, for example, I live in uh, apartment, I used to live in a apartment building in uh, Jackson Heights, where the airflow is partly designed in the wake of the pandemic of 1918, so the Spanish flu. Uh, so we could add that to the list of things that have to be regulated in terms of, uh, uh, and, and one uses vector in epidemiology as well, right? The, the viral thing that now crosses uh, membranes. Now let's call this maintenance of the semi-permeable membrane with a relation to an outside a metabolism. It comes from the Greek word, meaning change, but in this context, gestures specifically towards kinds of regulated change. Those familiar with the history of architecture will already know of the Japanese metabolic school. My use of the term is a little different, although I do want to acknowledge what for me is the sort of enduring uh, beauty of their pioneering work. However, like practically all architecture we know, the work was created within the Holocene geological era. It was not yet widely known that the intensity of planetary extraction of the building and the venting of waste back from unspecified vectors would in themselves bring about an end to an entire geologic era, the Holocene era. This is the hard part of thinking about architecture in the broader sense of the word. The thing that causes a certain unease. Arguably, it's architecture itself which put an end to the relative stability of the Holocene epoch and tipped the entire planet towards the instability of the atmosphere. Now, this is meant as a provocation, of course. It might be more useful to say that the endless, ever expanding circuits of capitalism is uh, what destroyed the Holocene and its conditions of life. Then we might want to think about how architecture as we know it is inseparable from capitalism. This architecture is coterminous with capitalism as a property form. What if no such stable relation were possible anymore? What if the Anthropocene signaled the end of architecture and called for some other concept of built form altogether? Maybe architecture has to transition to something else. So I want to call it kinotecture from uh, kinos, which among other things, might mean something new or more exactly a qualitative break to a different kind of time. And that's what the Anthropocene is in relation to the policy, a change in geological time. Kind of texture might be a way of thinking about building which does not create material that separates human life from other kinds of life. Kind of texture might have a different history to architecture. Most of what anyone knows about the form is from the Holocene. There are exceptions. Uh, Australian Aboriginal life uh, most likely has consistencies that stretch back to the late Pleistocene period. And one might be gathering not just a knowledge of particular building habits, but general practices of being in the landscape and there. Although one has to acknowledge also how fraught it is for a colonizing and extractivist culture to learn from that which it attempted but failed to destroy. The male some practices that anticipate kind of texture, these might be found at the margins of existing architectural history and thinking, at least by marking out the limits of what architecture as a discipline encloses. And I'll just mention a few with which I'm familiar. Perhaps in architecture to transition, it would help, perhaps for architecture to transition, it would help uh, to think about some other sort of things. One would be visionary proposals that critique and negate the limits of building practices, uh, that exists within capital's modes of production. Uh, for instance, uh, Constance uh, Babylon, which presupposes the abolition of private property and wage labor, uh, looked at it in terms of, I'm sorry, I don't have an elevation picture, but it stratifies all of planetary built space with automated production buried underground at the base layer, circulation at ground level in a mediating layer, and above it, a network of malleable structures. The spatial arrangements are sort of literal version of Marx's schema for understanding any mode of production. The economic base determines cultural and political superstructures. The abolition of private property erases the distinction between public and private space and the stable property relations and real estate. 
So the nomadic denizens, the New Babylon would be free to wander anywhere, change anything, and their only struggle could be with boredom. So Constance's work is a visionary critique of architecture, but not quite a step towards uh, kinetecture. The whole of human life is still kind of enclosed in one metabolism. Uh, Constance still imagines New Babylon as enclosed and separate from the world. It's a vision for one species only, the human, and it's a sort of limit case for some sort of um, trajectory for planetary modernism. I still love that. A step beyond that, in more ways, one might be in the sort of radical science fiction imaginary of Ken Stanley Robinson. Whether on Earth or on Mars, Robinson imagines built forms that are on the edge of plausibility, which take account of just how different form might have to become if the human is to endure. Uh, there's, uh, I think it has a book about New York City after it's been flooded, and it's, there's a whole chapter on what you need to do to reconfigure these buildings so they just still stand with the water sort of sloshing around. I don't even know if that's going to be possible. Uh, even if Robinson, uh, the human becomes other things as well. Uh, some of his characters are many gendered. Robinson imagines a sort of post-human multi-species world that understands permeability between worlds as key to any possible kind of kind of texture. What of actual real world examples? And here there might be uh, more to draw upon which address the instability of aspects of uh, kind of texture than, than its permeability. Uh, one example I've drawn on in the past is the kind of texture of war. Uh, Paul Brillio famously wrote about the bunkering of Europe by the Nazis and its inability to hold back the vectors of permeation of attack by the Soviet Union, United States, Britain, and their allies. The kind of texture that made possible the Normandy invasion, complete with temporary artificial harbors, this is a kind of extraordinary un undertaking in temporary unsafe buildings. And I've written elsewhere about the role of uh, people like Jacob Bernal and figuring out just exactly how you would kind of invade Normandy. It was like no one had any sort of uh, precursor knowledge for exactly how to do that. Uh, and it's kind of interesting that, that really I never talks about that. It's all about the bunkers failing. But it's nothing really about the success of the what I would kind of textual forms that made it possible to overcome them. Uh, so that part's kind of missing in that uh, that famous word. There's something also tempting though, uh, in the language of war is the way to think about the actual scene. What if instead we thought about the language of care? Uh, one thing that shifts perspective away from the kind of sort of masculinist sensibility of examples drawn from the built forms of war. So I'm going to go a little further than that and imagine kind of texture from the point of view of care networks, such as the covenants of care specific to trans women. The first thing a lot of trans women will ask about our fate, should our, this particular world collapse, how are we going to get our hormones? This, I mean, for real. Uh, there's uh, already beginnings of an interesting vein of speculative trans literature that makes uh, exogenous hormones a key to imagining. Uh, and let's call them like bit apocalyptic rather than post apocalyptic scenarios, because it's already started, right? I mean, it's not the future, we're in the middle of it. Gretchen uh, uh, Felkman's book, Manhunt. Uh, I forgot to put a slide up for it, but I really recommend that one. It's kind of astonishing. Uh, but perhaps apocalyptic is not a good genre for thinking about kind of texture. Uh, or the actual scenes, it tends to imagine that forms of mutual aid and covenants of care collapse when there is a break in the temporal order. Uh, when, if anything, the reverse might be the case, in a disruption, the care networks sometimes spring into action. We can see that a little bit with the uh, mutual aid that happened earlier in the lockdown uh, here in New York City. The, the emergency temporality actually highlights that. Um, some caveats are important, particularly for non-trans reader. Firstly, trans people are not the only ones whose existence depends on external technical uh, medical forms of support. One thing we can learn from disability studies is that at any time, uh, at, at some time, rather in some way, we all do. And the focus on trans people just picks out a specific case that I happen to know a little bit about. The other caveat is trans is not identical to its current forms of Western medicalized life. We do a lot of work on uh, the galley who were the uh, celebrants of the goddess Sibyl, which was an official cult in the Roman world and some parts of the Hellenic world. Um, and uh, uh, we're, we're sort of like folded into sort of Roman culture to some level of, uh, of kind of distaste, but we were there, right? trans women were present in uh, Roman and Greek times. We've always existed in many different ways, 
even in modern Western worlds, a lot of us have depended, may still depend on forms of mutual care outside of the medical and technical world. Still, it has to be stressed that many of us function much better and well with access to the tools to hack our own endocrine systems and modify the metabolisms of sex uh, of our bodies. Now, like most groups of people with a rare and specific form of embodiment, usually the best sort of knowledge and support about what it means to be one of us in the world. Reading what the experts have said about us and passed off as knowledge can fill a transsexual with rage. So the design of any possible kind of texture would surely benefit not just from consulting various kinds of other embodied, but actually handing over some of the process to us. So there are things that's invasive to ask someone about, which rules out the consultation anyway, and surely most non-trans people ought to know by now not to ask if we've had the surgery. Uh, even as a trans woman, I hesitate asking other trans women about this sort of thing. Uh, I once summoned up the courage to ask somebody about that, um, and it was kind of like, oh, yeah, there are ways that uh, sharing knowledge is relevant also to forms of other embodiment uh, and make those forms of uh, knowledge about other embodiment are then also connected to knowledge about uh, existing in emergency situations uh, and practices of care uh, and the, even, even the building of structures uh, that are enabling. So, yeah, in terms of what, how you might think about a uh, design process for a kind of texture, like the principle I'm suggesting there is ask the others, ask the sort of already live in it, makes sense, like who got there already. Uh, to give an example of, of work I found interesting after uh, Hurricane Katrina, civil land, land, so trans people spent time in the disaster era. I wrote a fictional account of that experience. This is sort of like delightful chapters about smash and grab raids in uh, uh, pharmacies and it's sort of like fighting the perspective uh, drug dealers for you know, like who's getting bought out of the cases when you go and break into uh, pharmacies. You're looking for the uh, injectable estri estrogen and they're looking for the uh, overheads, right? But maybe you trade, you know. <laughs> uh, like, you know, Post-apocalyptic book or movie, characters live in a sort of wall estate and raid abandoned stores and pharmacies. Fortunately, hormones are cheap, plentiful, industrial pharmaceutical product. Uh, it's up to measure down to be temporary. I was at a rave with a trans fan when the power went out and we stopped dancing and just stood there. And, and I'm like, what are we going to do, Alice, when civilization ends and we can no longer get our bees or our hormones? She gave me a level look and declared we're going down to the ship. <laughs> also, maybe that's a that's a strategy. Uh, whether we can endure many of the remaining futures or not, at least we currently live our lives. Uh, and maybe one can also start to detach uh, thinking about things like built form from futurity, like what does it mean to actually focus on the present? I think differently about an orientation to present time, which generation, generationally has already happened. You know, I have like Zoomer kids and their relation to future temporality is, is very, very different to mine because I was assumed they'd be one and they don't. Uh, thanks to uh, Jules Jill Peterson's pathbreaking work, we now have some ways to think about the plasticity of the metabolism of the body uh, and how we came to that through a uh, post war period of experiments in the extremely dubious and questionable quasi-scientific field of sexology. Uh, scientists found that bodies exist in a range of states that didn't fit a neat sort of binary of the sexes. Uh, through experimentation, they also discovered how easily modified the sex of the body was. This is like the crazy thing about the discourse about this, uh, is that in the history of sexology, it's the category of sex was the thing that was completely unpredictable. Uh, so sexology's solution was, oh, culture has stable two gender systems. So we have to cut bodies to fit that binary. Uh, but in transphobic discourse, discourse, it's been flipped as if the biology of the sex body was stable and given. Uh, and the era of trans people is thinking that, you know, you could kind of create something in the social realm that was separate from that. So the sex gender distinction got flipped. Uh, historically, so maybe we need to abandon it completely as an artifact of uh, a discipline whose goal really uh, much more than trans people was to modify intersex people to fit social convention. 
rather than deal with the sort of plurality of the way the bodies are sexed. So um, I wanted to sort of briefly uh, mention this part because I think the thing that's going to connect uh, trans knowledges and architecture is that mediating cat category of metabolism. Uh, so maybe one way to think this is there's people have a knowledge of how you can modify the metabolism of bodies. What does that potentially tell us for modifying the metabolism of architectures? And in what way are there knowledges and transport well, only one population might have it? Of what uh, instability? Around metabolisms are, and is that a knowledge that, you know, sort of metaphorically at least has something to tell us about uh, a, an unstable situation for architectural meta, uh, metabolisms or what I'm calling kinetecture? So I've used the word uh, plasticity, and it's a sort of somewhat uh, ambiguous gift of uh, modernity. Uh, my colleague um, uh, Heather Davis has written about how the, we have a slippage between plasticity as a concept and plastic as a class of materials that seem to offer uh, an endless malleability of uh, raw physical material, usually uh, fossil fuel based, but not only. Plastics are really you know, like wide range of materials. So um, to maybe think the plasticity of uh, built forms and bodies with a little bit of caution, but not to kind of abandon it altogether, uh, that the uh, plasticity of the body turns out to be kind of useful and important if you give people autonomy to decide how to do it. Uh, so it's kind of like separating it as a knowledge from its sort of instrumentalization in the name of maintaining uh, stable, predictable gender structures. Uh, and then what might that imply for thinking plasticity around built forms given that they too are going to need to become things that are uh, not anchored to a sort of stable sense of what uh, the environment is in which they would uh, live. Uh, I didn't put it in the slide set, but even another work of uh, Glenn Merkett, uh, Australian architect. Australia always had really, really unpredictable rainfall, but still you'd know kind of the, the maximum uh, for a given year that had been reported. And Glenn would do things like... Uh, uh, take the maximum rainfall, the surface area and pitch of a roof and build a gutter so it would be the right size for the maximum anticipated rainfall. Because the thing that always happens in Australia is the gutters overflow and the water flows down your walls and the next thing you know, you've got, you know, sort of the rising rod. Uh, but the thing is, even that doesn't work anymore because we actually don't know what future rainfalls are going to be, even in the unpredictable climatic space of the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean, yeah, like you used to at least know the minimum and maximum around which it would oscillate, and we don't sort of really know where that's going to land anymore. Uh, I kind of like diverged from my script and I don't know how to get back on it. <laughs> Let's see what's on the on the slides. Um, yeah, I, as much as I loved um, Constance's work, um, it did tend to presuppose a stable relationship between base and superstructure. You kind of thought you could build this thing on top of the planet and the planet would be stable and, and big enough to sustain it. Uh, but there's, I think, something still in uh, the kind of imaginary of uh, built form that thinks outside the uh, private property and the way that structures boundedness. Uh, and also kind of thinking that the uh, way in which built form might um, create possible futures involves a kind of social transformation as well, that there aren't built form specific solutions. And I'll just go through the uh, and talk to the slides. Uh, I got a really uh, useful concept out of John Bellamy Foster's work, and that was metabolic rift. Uh, Marx was reading uh, this soil scientist called uh, Justice von, von Liebig who had noticed that the social transformation of industrialization had destroyed the nutrient cycle in uh, British agriculture uh, and pardoned the vulgarity. But when you had substantial populations attached to rural land, then all of that human shit and piss went back on the land and with it the nitrogen and phosphorus. When you move that population to the city, 
it all went down the drain, a drain which had to be built for that purpose, because that's a whole thing about London, yeah, is the, is the building of the drains. But what it's doing is taking the phosphorus and nitrogen out to sea, leaving it depleted uh, on the farmland. And that was one of the main reasons for declines in agricultural productivity. Without those trace elements, crops don't do very well. So then there's a whole uh, imperial project to replace that, uh, and also the invention of ways to uh, synthesize. You can synthesize one of those, right? It's nitrogen you can chemically replace. Uh, it now turns out uh, the literature on this is extremely dubious, as it is with peak oil, but there is a conversation around peak phosphorus. When do we run out of accessible phosphorus for agriculture is a question to which there actually, actually aren't really good answers at the moment. Uh, all right, so it's an example of metabolic rift that uh, on leading sort of diagnosis, it's the beginning of soil science. Uh, Marx picks it up and is much more interested in how uh, commodification plays a role in that break and is key to uh, a disruption in the possibility of uh, a metabolic relation mediated by uh, techniques and relations of production between the human and the world. Uh, and what Foster does is, is extract that from Marx as a concept that Marx is only grabs locally and globalize it. What if what we're experiencing was global metabolic rift, uh, such that uh, nothing returns to a point of stasis? You get runaway kinds of transformation, of which transformation of uh, uh, climate will turn out actually to be only one. Uh, so the bad news is the climate crisis is immediate and pressing, uh, but the even worse news is, well, then actually there's the nitrogen cycle, et cetera, et cetera. There's maybe about seven or eight crises of that nature that will learn, uh, precisely because of an inability to think through uh, metabolically how anything might return to its place of origin to be remade, reused, and so forth. So what then does that imply for architecture? Uh, to what extent are architectures premised on uh, excluding the externality of what I'm calling the vector in and the vector out? Uh, where did what it's built from come from and where does it go to? Uh, and it's kind of assumed there's a sort of an open plane uh, to which all of those things go. Uh, but if that practice is, has destabilized uh, our expectations about what variation is, even in something like climate. Maybe architecture becomes something like architecture. How do you feel for not a, a sort of knowable variation, but unknowable variation? And then where are the existing knowledges of how to build either social relations or built forms in those contexts? Uh, how to build built forms, the uh, people who have that skill would have thought is the military, um, but you could sort of question that uh, in the contemporary situation. Um, but the example I've found really instructive is to think through the opposite of Rulio's example of bunker archaeology, which is the uh, construction of the artificial harbors that made DJ possible in the first place, a kind of extraordinary undertaking. The fences sort of change the scale and get out of that sort of masculinist, militarized space. What do networks of care look like among people uh, for whom there isn't a kind of presumption of uh, a stable relation between interiority and exteriority? So I you think know, I'm doing a better summary of what was in the actual paper, so I'll keep doing that. Um, Jordi Rosenberg, like, interestingly put together the idea of metabolic drift as a planetary experience and metabolic drift as a trans experience. And I found that kind of interesting thought. Um, still don't know philologically whether uh, experiments in sexology are what generalized our thinking of metabolism uh, in the mid 20th century. It's, it's kind of a little project. When do we start thinking about metabolism uh, as a concept rather than as a sort of specific thing about how an organism worked? And then how do we think together uh, what it means to manage uh, unstable, destabilized, plastic, 
necessarily modifiable uh, bodies and built forms. How those two thoughts connected is sort of like the project that uh, I think I'm sort of heading into uh, step by step. And then uh, it's not quite in Geordie's writing, uh, um, but the other side of this, looking at it from a trans perspective, is uh, this useful term dysphoria. And there might be more than one kind of dysphoria, but one specific to a trans experience is gender dysphoria. And dysphoria you can think of as uh, a kind of signaling that uh, is throwing off a kind of a, 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 an unendurable noise. Uh, so what is that unendurable noise of gender dysphoria that means the body has to transition, that you can no longer ignore the signal that the plasticity of the body, the modification of the metabolism has to happen. And then what would it mean to generalize that to think about planetary dysphoria? Uh, so this loops us back to the title uh, and obviously it's the sort of thing I would think here, right? Like the whole planet is transgender. The planet is trans and is dysphoric as fuck, uh, but is ignoring the signs, is ignoring the sign that a transition needs to happen. So how do we then think through what it means to have the noise? Or it's perceived as noise from the point of view of an existing metabolic state, but it's really the signal that this metabolic form isn't endurable, isn't going to last and would need to become something else. And then what specifically is the role of uh, thinking about forms one might build uh, or modify or um, practices of uh, techniques that would have some passage through time? I think that's an even broader way of thinking about the architectural, uh, such that uh, one was at least leaving open the possibility of the modification of forms towards forms of social technical cohabitation with a planetary space that might uh, kind of first the endurance stability. Uh, it's shocking to me that people talk about the post Anthropocene. It's going on for a thousand years. Yeah, like there, there's no post yet. Uh, but there might be in in our thinking as to how then uh, one uh, reimagines what um, practices of uh, build form practices of relation, practices of mutual aid might look like if you take away the arche in architecture, that sense of that something could be founded that would remain stable. That's the thing that went away. Uh, and so to think in, in place of the arche, to think kinos in, in, in place of the stable founded structure, the novelty of temporality as then uh, conceptually the space into which one would think what it means to build. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Come hang out. So first of all, thank you very much. And um, I have to say that when when I was trying to think of the name for this lecture series, I was talking about it with a friend. And when I said architectures of transition and was floating it, uh, he said to me, well, people might think that it's about gender theory, not about architecture. And I said, you know, somewhere we'll find a bridge. <laughs> I'm glad that on day one, um, the, the link was made. So that's fantastic. Um, but I mean, I think maybe I'll start. I, mean, I have many questions for you, but in, in some instances of being through it, I think I basically only have one question for you and all of these questions are the same question. But um, I think I'll, I'll start with this notion of metabolic drift um, because it's, it's really a problem of separation, which in many ways we can think about spatially. And so that's useful for us as architects. Um, but also as you bring up this question of uh, kind of texture, uh, tech, texture, <laughs> which um, in many ways is about uh, thinking through the unknown and, and considering how architecture might develop ta tactics to deal with metabolic risk. I think in some ways it's very easy to architecture to fall back on stable forms of knowledge in that sense, right? Because you can quantify carbon, you can do life cycle analysis, and then you can track things spatially and kind of do diagrams. So in many ways, there, there's a kind of 
falling back to um, stable forms of knowledge. So I think in many ways to um, avoid that, it seems like uh, you have to keep on zooming out to think about the modes of knowledge themselves. And this is what I really like about your work. And you know, in your argument that we can't continue on the same conceptual foundations, um, then you bring up this question of what is architectural knowledge? And with that, there, like, there's the question of what is architectural training, right? And I think in some ways, my question is about like, what is architectural knowledge, but also how does that relate to questions of training and how we train ourselves to think in certain patterns or how we communicate knowledge from one generation to another. And I think we often uh, call our education training, right? We say, I was trained as an architect or we give them formal exercises and we say, this is their training, right? Um, but I think that your framing suggests that it's not just about skills, right? <laughs> It's not just about um, that kind of training. It's more about asking what we have to know in the first place, right? And we have to rethink what we think that we know. So um, I guess maybe my question for you would be boiling down to just this question of modes of knowledge and knowledge production. And how can design perhaps be a way of knowing as opposed to a set of skills? That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and um, maybe one way to think about it would be to think about how just the sort of design of knowledge practices and institutions themselves uh, built in uh, whatever, not just capitalism is, but whatever the policy is. And and one might be things a little bit outside of that. Uh, I don't quite know what to do with uh, the existence of knowledge is passed down with some accuracy that predate it. And, and one that does exist is certain Australian Aboriginal knowledge that's of the Pleistocene. And well, how, how did that knowledge get transmitted? And part of the answer is they did peer review. Uh, there's, there's structures of verification of whether someone's got a story right, and social structures are built around a verification of the passage of information. Um, but also around very interesting understandings of the role of beginning, uh, which our sort of documentary trail that we suppose this will always have a stable archive, don't actually do quite as well. So maybe let's look at how other people have done knowledge uh, in the institutional sense of it. That bit could be kind of useful. Uh, there's a little tension also to how it goes wrong, like misuse of information is clearly one of the key things that we have to deal with at the moment, yeah? Um, there's that, uh, and yeah, what have we taught some of those uh, kind of extraordinary uh, limit cases when people had to design things uh, without knowing uh, what you could measure or quantify or predict. Uh, an example I'm really struck by is like the person who figured out it was impossible to actually do the D-Day invasion of Normandy was this um, uh, Marxist scientist called Jacob Bernal. And they just like dropped this problem on his lap. And it's like, all right, well, can tanks drive up these beaches? Like sort of take it for granted that it work, but no one knew that. And there's no way to find out. So you send frogmen to get um, sand samples. You uh, gather postcards of what the beach looked like. There's no Google Maps, right? And the, the map of the beach doesn't tell you everything about it. You ask local fishermen where all the rocks are that aren't on the map. You do a history of map making, which shows you how certain things get left off it. Uh, the bit I love is uh, Bernal was reading, of course, he's trained in Britain, so he had that. He's reading Roman records about what happened on the beach, and it turned out that there's a layer of peat under the sand. Uh, which was kind of catastrophic. There's a, I think it's 15th century romance that talks about there being a causeway there that had been gone for centuries. Uh, there's mysteries about place names that are solved when you find out there used to be a harbor that's been blocked and all of that affects the uh, grade, the reliability of the beach. So, well, uh, it's all that together. Uh, they also fake invaded a British beach that was similar. Uh, which freaked out all of the locals because they thought the Nazis had showed up. 
But uh, it's how all of that's involved in producing a knowledge of how to do the thing no one had done before, no one had any idea if it would possibly work. Uh, so who has the sort of flexibility and adaptability and intuition and creativity to like think about how to solve a problem like that with all of those unknowns? So I think though how do you create exercises that train people to be able to do that strikes me as kind of a problem and do it outside of a military framework as well. Because uh, that's often where some of that expertise is necessary. So, yeah, like how do we think about training where, um, and it's a thing about how disciplines work. You just assume that you can take constants from other disciplines and not have to worry about it. So, you just assume you can take certain constants about uh, social organization, about law and regulation, uh, about climate, uh, about geology. Uh, you sort of take the answers from those things as sort of givens and as constants and do your bit in relation to that. But what if they're not there? Uh, then also the division of labor of knowledge won't hold. Uh, and that is something I don't you know, have a train for yet. Right. And that's a big thing in architecture. We borrow yeah. from a lot of other disciplines. Yeah. And, all, and all disciplines do. Yeah. And like I, I think of architecture as sort of like laminating these very, very different kinds of knowledge. And that is what's exciting about what architects do. Uh, is like there's an aesthetic piece and there's an engineering piece and a legal piece and a social cultural piece and a materials piece and sort of layer all those you know kinds of knowing together. But what if like you know and that's maybe like seven or eight kinds. There's like another ten that you have to add you know to to be able to laminate together to yeah. create something. It just becomes harder and harder to be yeah. an architect. Unfortunately, but yes, yeah. everybody else's job gets harder too. Of course, of course. So I wonder, maybe I'm seeing within that two threads of, you know, how you might think about knowledge and architectural knowledge specifically. One is that mm -hmm. there's a question of kind of preparing for these unstable conditions and kind of resetting our own frameworks, our own state of mind, even um, as designers and kind of reconceptualizing. Uh, so there's a kind of prep work involved in terms of like working towards the shift. But then there's also, I think, a question of how architecture can participate in the kind of projecting so that we can also think about like what we're working towards, right? And I think embedded in what you're saying, there is a question of techniques and methods, which are um, ways of thinking about means to an end. But at the same time, I'm also thinking about um, the story in Molecular Red that you tell of Alexander uh, Bolkanov and the Prolet folk, right, where they have this really specific mission, which they state as changing labor, changing everyday life, and changing affect. And one thing that you say in that book is that it was um, this this movement, and as they were working towards it, it wasn't an end in itself. It's really more about the process of transformation. So I wonder if there's maybe this two pronged thing about like questioning the means and questioning the ends, and how do you see those kind of relating to each other? Are they in conflict at all, or like do we have to think about them simultaneously? <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things I love about uh, Constance stuff is the project's impossible. Like you can't build it. You know? yeah. uh, but that's what's sort of delightful about it is is you know we sort of uh, think yeah that's impossible. We're going to build these things that are possible, but it turned out possible things you could build aren't possible either. Like, right. none of this is going to work, right. right? So we don't really have a possible architecture right? or much of anything else. Yeah, like, this didn't work either. Uh, and, yeah, it turned out, uh, you know, communism is this impossible utopian dream. It's like the, uto the utopian dream of capitalism turns out also to be impossible. So, like, you can't to fall back to that. It doesn't, it's obviously not going to work. Uh, isn't that kind of exciting? Like, we have no idea, you know, like, what a... Uh, civilization now be that's even a word like that for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I, I find you know work along both those lines having a necessary tension like here are the things you could actually do and here are the things that you can't do but their impossibility points to the impossibility of the things that seem practical. Uh, and occasionally on juries and stuff, and the stuff that wins is often, uh, you know, it's it's well intentioned, uh, environmental sound, but sort of decorative. We're going to fix this little thing, uh, and that's the one that wins because the thing you could actually build or actually do. But it's not going to work, you know. Like it's it makes us feel better that you do that little thing. Yeah. I'm the one who votes for these, like, you know, uh, impossible and practical things. No, you can't do that. 
It's like, yeah, I know, that's sort of the point. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a conflicting relationship even within the discipline of architecture with our capacity to kind of imagine things. And, and there's, yeah. you know, there's a kind of reaction against that kind of paper architecture, I think, in this moment, because there's this kind of, it's an emergency. Like we can't yeah. be like daydreaming. We have to be like on the ground. But I think that there are so many constraints to architectural practice that the truth of the matter is that projects executed according to the constraints of a neoliberal real estate economy are not going to be able to function in the long yeah. run either. So like we, we do, yes, I, I totally agree that there's this issue around like believing in pragmatism within a system that we know already doesn't work. Um, so it's kind of this um, endless uh, sort of conflict that. Yeah, I, I think it's just like staying in the emotionally difficult space mm -hmm. of the gap between those two things. Right. Uh, I like, I think interesting artists and media usually do that. Right. It's it's sort of when you sort of uh, you're sort of imagining down the scale of the problem so that you can work right. and pay your student loans. Like I get it, right. uh, but nobody says you have to close the gap mm -hmm. between you know like how partial and dysfunctional that's going to be you know, yeah. and what we kind of know and what we can imagine yeah well i wonder also in molecular red you compare capitalist realism <laughs> to capitalist romance you say both are insufficient and what we really need is a kind of alternative realism can you maybe talk about each of those in turn um maybe especially the alternative realism and what that might be like? yeah i don't know if alternative is a good word for it but um yeah, I, and molecular red sometimes gets grouped with um, new materialism, but it's a it, it's a little bit more pro science than some of that work is. Like, there's things we do actually now kind of know, and to sort of let that in a little bit. So yeah, like what do we actually know about um, possible climate futures, for example? Uh, like that's a pretty I, it turns out a lot of modeling was way more optimistic, you know, um, than things are actually turning out. But still, like, you know, that's there. Uh, so, yeah, what what would have been to them to sort of start um, thinking what each of the pieces of knowledge that we have point to, without it necessarily forming a coherent picture that you can synthesize? Like that's the thing that doesn't work so well. Uh, Hegel was probably the last person to aim at a synthetic you know, knowledge. Um, but to think rather of how do the different practices of knowledge production and world making relate to each other without a shared dialect and without uh, a coherent project, but where we all kind of need each other. Like maybe that's a realism. Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know if, if you've had that experience, you go talk to people in like very, very different disciplines and you start by thinking they're not. Uh, and obviously they have no idea what they're talking about. Right. Then you're like, actually, <laughs> uh, yeah, I see how you see, I see how you see things is the important thing to get to. But you don't arrive at the synthesis of those points of view. They stay right. kind of at odds in a way. Right, right. Great. Um, well, I want to open also for questions from the audience if there are any. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for the talk. And um, that last that last slide was really helpful for um, for me to kind of follow your thoughts. And um, here, the, the gender dysphoria, in a way, um, that moment where where transformation becomes a, a need, um, and that decision is made. I was trying to think about that, like is it embodied an embodied question that they then gets gets a, gets a decisive uh, moment. And uh, when I think about it in art, I started questioning like what would God that transformation to happen? And in the body is in a way, and you can expand on this, I guess desire. Desire is informing that transformation to be done. And in architecture, even if we think of, I, I guess the model of desire in architecture is still to, for architecture to not fall down and not leak. Um, and even if we think about catastrophe, 
it is still to be sheltered in all these things, right? And so architecture continues to be um, a straight architecture, let's say. Um, what would you suggest are ways to model new forms of desire for architecture? <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, uh, my, I mentioned my father was an architect who built a lot of stuff in uh, my hometown, uh, and which was always very conservatively engineered. This one thing, it was sort of, and, and the same kind of ridiculous until there was an earthquake. And we're not in an earthquake zone. Like, why was there an earthquake in Newcastle, New South Wales? None of the buildings suffered more than minor damage, and yet there are other things that collapsed. Uh, around the Workers Club in Newcastle collapsed and, and killed people. Uh, so it's kind of like, <laughs> was there an intuition about, you know, like, but but was it more that his desire was for, you know, a kind of certain uh, perpetuity and, and stability and that kind of thing? So it's kind of like a slightly weird, not cost effective desire led to a good outcome kind of in the long run, at least in terms of saving lives. I think the bank had other things to say about it and the investors and so on along the way, you know. Um, so yeah, it's getting like a weird personal version of that story. Um, but then also a, a, another one, which is I don't know if desire is a word I'd want to use, um, because it it sort of ends up in a sort of psychoanalytic language a little easily. Uh what about E? Uh, like what, what is it that one needs for a body? And then that, that sort of goes through the scales. There's what one needs for the individual body, the social body, and the, the body of the form that we're always necessarily inhabiting. Uh, and then what are the uh, knowledges connected to that? Uh, the one thing I think um, trans experience brings to that uh, it's this sort of ambivalent sense that uh, some things about, uh, just to take the example of endocrinology, is just sort of really established science, and it's a very easy hack to change the hormones your body runs on. On another level, there's a lot of stuff about how hormones work in biology that no one knows yet. So the hack works, but no one knows the details of what's going on. You know, like you're in between... But how much knowledge is enough? Like we have enough to make something work. Um, uh, transgender medicine around endocrinology is maybe 70 years old. You know? But on the other hand, we have no idea of the details of how any of that functions. Then the next bit is that uh, uh, the first endocrinologist I had uh, was very gatekeeping. There's a protocol that's in place in the United States. It's actually not great. Uh, but she sort of very cheerily said that she was going up for her board recertification after 10 years of practice. And she's very proud of the fact there's now four questions about transgender medicine on the endocrinology uh, exam. And I'm like, well, how many were on it when you first took it? None. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, so I'm, how do you sort of work the line between I respect her knowledge of endocrinology because she treats people with hundreds of different uh, needs around it. On the other hand, I know more than she does about this particular thing. And I know that fairly reliably because I've read the freaking scientific literature. I read the textbook, but I'm only reading the chapter that applies to me. <laughs> I'm not reading the other chapters, so I don't care. So what, how do you put different kinds of uh, need and different kinds of knowledge together particularly around moments of transformation is maybe where I'm, you know, kind of going with, with that thought. I wonder if I could just add a footnote to that because it, man, it sounds, it reminds me actually, of, I think often we talk about architecture in this kind of personified way, like architecture does this or architecture mm -hmm. fails to realize or architecture is lost space. And it's no architecture, because part of your question is like, where would the will to change mm -hmm. come from, right? And, uh, in some ways, I keep thinking that in the end, it comes from the conversations that we have with each other and it comes from architects, right? So like maybe, and I'm guilty of this, I always talk about architecture as though it's a person. <laughs> um, but, you know, in many ways, I think it's defaulting to that because it's a it's a discipline and it's, it is a way of, I think it is a way of knowing. It's a yeah. way of seeing the world through a particular lens, right? Of, of space and form and material, et cetera. So it is a way of knowing. But yeah, I guess that question of the will, where does the will to change come from is a really interesting one. Great. Yeah, well, it's going to come from necessity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, like I, I kind of as a, as a materialist, like we're not going to do this by changing hearts and minds first. Yeah. So things are going to have to fall apart. Which they are. Which they are. <laughs> yeah. You got uh, that check. Yeah. Uh, in um, in like the floods that happened in Pakistan, we're not even talking about it. Yeah. You've seen the, the footage of that. That's wild. Yeah. Like, how do you even do emergency building in that situation? Right. I don't know. Right. And also, given that we have such a poverty of ideas of how to do things differently, there, there's a problematic rebuilding that occurs yeah. in that moment, too, where the rebuilding itself is kind of doubling down on all of the old ideas of, yeah. you know, carbon and material and, you know, even just how we structure society or even how architecture holds social form, right? We just kind of keep um, sort of uh, building the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, and then who's got, not, who's got interesting knowledge is, you know, uh, I was thinking of two like very different works that uh, Super Studio did. Like there's a sort of visionary, like this is like the bad future version. And it's like, it's completely accurate in a way. You know, like those huge white structures across the landscape just yeah. abstract from everything. It's like the bad vision sort of right. stuff. And they'll riot, you know. Right. Uh, and then there's this project on walking sticks. I always had trouble figuring out how they work together. And it's like they're collecting and looking at you know, walking sticks that people have made and designed and built, but they're all vernacular ones. They're not industrial ones. Uh, and it's sort of, to me, it's like in the tension between those two things. It's like, well, people with mobility issues kind of know <laughs> exactly what they need, right. you know, and it's not the one you get in the social supply store usually, you know, like right. this is the specific thing for this body. Right. So there's sort of like the uh, a quite specific pocket of knowledge in that disability. Like pointing to. Um, other questions? Hello, thank you. Hi. First of all, like, really appreciated it. And like, you went over so much material, which is like, how do I, how do I respond or ask a question that makes sense <laughs> considering how much you shared? But, um, you know, I, you were talking about plastic and like plastic body. And within this idea of like climate change and prophecy, and like it has me thinking of also in relation to hormones because there is like literature out there talking about plastic and just contaminants being the cause of like hormonal and physiological imbalances in the body. And that can also lead to like a lot of like purist people who are like, oh, don't use this kind of Teflon, don't use this kind of spatula, you know, just don't use any of those things to preserve like the natural balance of the body. And um, it's interesting because it's like, I, I think about like intersexuality and or inter, the intersex experience and like how it's not just, um, you know, it's often understood and represented as like, something to be seen in terms of genitals, but it's also something that exists hormonally and is a huge spectrum and something that a lot of people probably are, but don't know that they are. And the same yeah. with a lot of people are probably trans and don't know they're trans. And a lot of people are probably disabled and don't know they are that either. But like, I, it just feels like we're like being surrounded by so much pollutants and so much plastic that in a way, like these bodies are being forced to become trans in a lot of ways. <laughs> the body is transitioning without me even take, going to the endocrinologist. And I just like thought a lot about this because like I, I have a hormonal imbalance and now I'm like going through like a medical transition like intentionally, right? But it's like having had, knowing that say like, oh, I have PCOS, which is like knowing that my body is naturally going towards a certain direction that falls outside of the binary of what a female body is supposed to be. It's, it's really interesting because I'm like, oh, my body knew it was trans this whole time. So it was going in that direction. It's just what exists with medicine is allowing me now to pursue that. Um, so that's more like just a response. And like, I also like in thinking about the planetary dysphoria, just considering like, because the image here, it really, I like it, it's strong, but then at the same time, it really pisses me off, mm -hmm. because it's, like, this act of, like, treating a sick planet, and at the same time, I'm, like, sick 
implies a value system. Not to say that the planet is well by any means. It's like so hard to approach the conversation without having a value system, but like this feels so much like, oh, we need to heal the world, heal the planet, but it's like, oh, but the planet is just, it's just like crumbling because, because that's exactly how these systems work. Like this is, nothing is not working. This is exactly, capitalism is working the way it was intended to work. So it's, I'm kind of like leaning towards a sort of anarchy towards this image because I'm like, yes, and just like destroy it and destroy the image of the planet to begin with. Um, so I don't know if there's a question in there, but part of my mind is also thinking like, what are ways to represent and imagine the planet in a way that isn't going to be so tied down to like resources and also the idea of like territories and boundaries in that sense and nation. So how do we imagine a planet outside of this like vacuum that exists in space? Yeah, this is the least worst image I could find. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and I, I still like it because it's sort of like a, the thing about, at least how I think about transition is you're making something different. Mm -hmm. um, like you, and and I personally don't think of the trans body as necessarily imitative. But this cis model, it's you're just kind of constructing something mm -hmm. for for a year. Uh, and you know, like maybe the thought is uh, like trans people make intersex people as well, but I I, I can't speak. So that from experience, but you have to be architect of your own body. So you're drawing knowledges uh, and laminating them uh, and have to be a little skeptical about some of them as well. Uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, this is endocrinology is pretty reliable science, but endocrinologists are not always to be trusted in their individual understanding of it and so on. Um, other trans people have all this knowledge of how to do it. Other trans people are also batshit crazy and have the most ridiculous ideas you have ever heard. Because I'm in the forums and I have to like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, that one might not be true. <laughs> it's pretty good. And, and some of it's, you know, like folk knowledge stuff too. Uh, spiral lactone might not be good for a trans woman, but there's no study. It's just everybody's reported experience. It's probably not good. Um, so yeah, how do you sort of like layer, you know, laminate knowledges together to be the architect of a, a body that has to become something else is maybe a, uh, and then are there ways that, uh, uh, just like architecture can look at those knowledge practices and what's to be learned from it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's not unprecedented. There's a lot, um, there's a whole, uh, field of study of what have learned from favela builders, for example. Uh, like what if you took away the assumption that sort of regulated property bound building was the norm because for most of the planet it's probably not anymore and what do we learn from favela builders and their equivalents elsewhere uh, about form about regulation of boundaries uh, about how rights are negotiated and that kind of thing uh, so like maybe maybe that would be where one might be looking and, and teaching more of it. Talk about like knowledge and is this <clears throat> like we had a lecture from him for our lecture series last semester, Jack Halberstam. And what's interesting is that we're using like such academic words to describe things that are going to have to break outside of the academic model, outside of the university structure. And so it's like it brings into question like what are what are my ways of knowing what are my ways of like passing down knowledge and it has to exist outside of like visual representation and also like a verbal or written like it has to exist in many different ways which I think you you bring up yeah it's why I use the example of um J.D. Bernal who's not a redeemable figure in lots of ways I'm fascinated by him as um uh Probably, pardon my English, but probably fucked every secretary he ever had. You know, like, it's not a problem, but it's interesting. Uh, and as a uh, scientist was working in uh, X-ray crystallography, and it's sort of at the boundary between uh, physics and chemistry, uh, and I think core, you know, a field will emerge out of it, but the work wasn't in a field. It was at boundaries between fields. Uh, so how then was that kind of person who ended up being like a good 
person turns hat to do something like figure out how to invade Normandy. Because like the, the, what he did to make that possible ends up in a kind of um, a discipline, it's like operations research, uh, but it becomes standardized later as to how you solve those problems. But like there wasn't a standard, there's, you know, it isn't a field. Uh, it's the knowledge is all laminated together around a specific problem. And sometimes the knowledge structures that are in are able to do that, and sometimes they're not. They're sort of taking it for granted that the kinds of knowledges, the disciplines that, that they're in, the relation between the disciplines is a stable artifact. Um, but I think we're moving into a sort of period where the generalized instability of boundaries between knowledges uh, at a time when, um, you know, like non knowledge is just proliferating madly. Uh, and that part really kind of terrifies me. Uh, like people will believe any nonsense at all, other than that the empires have declined, the climate change is going to screw us. Like no one wants to, you know, like anything at all, other than that. Uh, so that's bad. <laughs> but then in, in that situation of instability, the formal structures of knowledge probably don't do very well. And we would need, you know, as uh, Hunter and Thompson used to say, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. Um, but how do you train people for that? Um, which might also not happen next year, or might, or might happen in 20 years, it might not happen to everybody, but yeah, how do you like build, in, build that in? And um, Bogdanov had an interest in that, and that was not the reason I was interested in, in Bogdanov and people trying to create the knowledge apparatus with through the Russian Revolution, which is sort of massively destabilizing and so disorienting. Have a question for you. Oh. Yeah. Chandra. Oh, you just tell Chandra. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> so thank you so much for a great uh, generative talk. Uh, I was wondering if your idea of kinotecture does could it could it embody a sort of transition from centering the figure of the anthropos? which creates this categorical dichotomies that uh, hierarchize life. So is, um, could kind of picture be understood also as a sort of trans ecology or what do you mean when you talk about the earth as a trans earth? I'm sorry, there's like three questions in one, but <laughs> I'm just trying to yeah. put everything in there. Thanks. Yeah, um, there's a whole, um... I tend to rename the Anthropocene that I'm sort of not interested in. I think that it got, you know, like, first of all, respect the people who figured it out, um, who are mostly from uh, geology. In the context of geology, to make Anthropos central was actually like weirdly counterintuitive and strange. And those of us from humanistic discourses, I think, missed that. It's where, like, we don't all speak the same language. Like, words don't mean the same thing, and it's worth paying attention to that. Uh, so I was trying to move this out away from Arche, uh, from uh, that set, and it's a it's an interesting uh, word part that connects to what's foundational and what's ordered, uh, and also to the order of, uh, like arch as a prefix on someone's title makes it more, yeah, like an archdeacon is more than a deacon. Uh, so what's higher is more foundational. Like weird things happen in language when you start to unpick it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thought rather than the sort of like the orderly and spatial to get into the sort of temporal um, conceptual space and hence um, kindness or kairos uh, as like time has changed, right? But what, how do we think of qualitative change in how temporal change happens? Like that seems to me to be what uh, Anthropocene was calling on us to do. Uh, and to think at uh, geological time scales uh, as something that uh, most humanistic knowledge, which now include architecture, doesn't really do. Uh, like that struck me as, as particularly challenging and needing, needing some work on language. Uh, but yeah, like if you talk to geologists, like, Geology is weird. Like the, the time frame 
really can be billions and millions of years, you know, it's what I've seen, um, you know, built form that wasn't built by humans. Um, yeah, and I'm a little resistant to um, dissolving what's uh, specific about the human uh, into, you know, actor network theory, for example, because it sort of absolves us of responsibility a little bit. Like, we're the ones who broke it. Um, but at the same time, sort of recognizing that there's this kind of deep interdependence uh, on other forms of life and on non life as well. So, yeah, there's a few different things there. But yeah, it's also one I sort of don't think what I'm doing was new materialism or something different. Because uh, those tend to end up being quite contemplative. Uh, of course, I think if you center not the human practices, practices of labor, practices of knowledge, uh, then it's neither about human that becomes a derivative concept from a practice, uh, but nor is it distributed into a sort of speculative universe that you only look at as if one was an outside observer. So I, ironically, what you're centering human centers it even more in the figure of the external observer. I have a question, Professor Walk, if I may. Thank you. So um, I've been thinking on um, maybe just an interest in the difference between planetary story that leads to the transformation versus the end of the world or the end of the planet. I think um, the, the Jack Thompson, which we, were, we had last semester, kind of starts this conversation. Um, in a way where he was taught, he has this notion, you know, on world day, the idea of sort of having a, like necessarily having an end to the world in order for something to happen after. And I think like the, the one slide that kind of stood out to me was the simple you know, comic where it's not really about creating something new that it adapts, but it's more like uh, existing in the ruins of of something that's that's ended, um, which I find to be really interesting. It's kind of this like anarchist utopian uh, argument that always that like can never end. Where you, where you want to ask whether like you need you need the ruins of what existed before to survive, and you create something new separate and like a kind of popular Russell thing. Um, which I think the second one is a little bit less likely for. Kind of millennia long effects of democracy. Um, but I'm also interested in, in what that means in terms of forms of knowledge, and like what is salvage, what has to be discarded, um, what needs to be excavated, or like kind of after this sort of collapse happens. And I guess my question is just um, do you think that new forms of knowledge? need to be produced, or do you think that that would um, create the same problems that we have to begin with? Um, or do you think that um, everything we need to know already exists and <laughs> needs to be sorted out and like collectively decided upon, and, like put in like different bins of like, yeah, it's a really abstract question. Yeah, but I like that I, well, yeah, what if, what, if we, what if we don't need novelty? Uh, but it already exists. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm always a little wary of, uh, we need a new theory. And it's like, yeah, but we always keep creating new ones. And like, yeah, what if, what if you already had what we needed? But it was more a question of um, how things are connected or what practices of interactions between different knowledges are. Like that might be more useful and sort of getting off uh, I, you know, I, I get a lot of manuscripts uh, in the humanities and everyone's got a new theory, like no one is ever. And it's like, it's sort of my job to be like that evil, like reader too. But like, yeah, this has already been done. Like these are the five versions of it. You're pretending didn't exist to create the illusion of novelty, you know? Um, yeah, so I'm a little wary of um, beginnings and endings in that sense. Um, Maybe maybe we need to still have them, like periodizing is kind of important, but to be, just to be a little skeptical about when things begin and end. Um, to think about the 
maybe the ending of a world, but not the world is a useful distinction. Um, uh, certain species seem to be doing really pretty well at the moment, uh, you know. Uh, I, not not my domain, right? But maybe the future belongs to jellyfish. I don't know. It seems like warmer water. Uh, like maybe it's a planet of jellyfish. Like maybe brains were a bad idea. You know, I, uh, it's crazy to make light of it. Like, um, yeah. So and then um, to not lose the indigenous thread that there's knowledges that might predate. Um, there's certainly a handful that predate the Holocene, but some, uh, definitely knowledge is a predate capitalism and colonialism. Uh, and <laughs> what, um, and how to think those without appropriating them or viewing them as materials so, because they're not for us. Uh, maybe somebody else uh, picks that up, finds a way to make that ongoing. Would be, would be another strand of it. Um, yeah, and I, but it, to think novelty on the scale of the change of geological epoch, I don't think we really know how to do. Uh, and I think that one's worth, what if we stop having to be new about everything, but thought that was the kind of novelty uh, a little more profoundly. I think that might help uh, a little bit. Um, and, then, and to pay attention to people for whom that's the knowledge they want to or the concept they want to think about. Uh, and there's, there's a whole, it's a whole controversy. Um, Stratigraphers, is the branch of geologists who periodize things as whether that's a thing that they're doing or not. Um, and then other kinds of earth science uh, do slightly different things with it, but you know, that thing, a different geological body part. Um, so yeah, and, and to sort of think, oh, we sort of talk about uh, Anthropocene without much reference to the Holocene. So what do we even know about that? And then what do we know about Pleistocene, the one immediately preceding it? So to think of those as moments of novelty that are way outside human, you know, sort of time frames, seeing that the human is kind of implicated in the last one in a very particular way. Yeah, all the skepticism about novelty and, and beginnings. Um, and a little bit less uh, apocalyptic thinking, right? Maybe the wheels just come off slowly and we have to like repurpose them into something else rather than imagining in the Hollywood version that there'll be narrative. You know? I think the skepticism of novelty is very helpful for architecture in particular yeah. too, because I think we have uh, a history that is rooted in the kind of historical avant-garde of really validating this idea of transgression and kind of the rejection that came before. And like a radical architect is one who proposes this totally new thing that no one has ever seen before, right? Whether that is the modern paradigm coming in and saying, you know, we're going to build this industrialized world, or whether it's even just the postmodern movement saying we're rejecting the modern, we kind of have this tradition of being reactionary. Um, and I think that We've seen how that runs the ground at a certain point. And, and for me, I think it also highlights the difference between transgression and transition, right? And, and in architecture and the architecture discipline, I think transgression has been the model, like reject what came before, propose something new. Um, and even though we're in a moment where there has to be a kind of, um, yeah, there's a death of a world that has to happen. And that involves us saying, okay, this is no longer tenable and we will reject this. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's a little bit different than the paradigm of transgression in architecture, which I think in many uh, occasions can be a little bit facile too. And I think that transition in many ways is more complex and maybe more interesting than transgression in many ways. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a there's a delightful standard history on, on which I was raised, you know, and I love all that stuff. But there's a kind of, uh, uh, colonial dimension uh, mm -hmm. to that as well, you know, from where did the, the great transformation of architectural style originate? Where were they received? Right. The whole question. Right, the, right, uh, exactly. Could you see a building of Chandigarh and what happened to it? Right. Right. Is that a hand? No. Yeah. Up back. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Work. It's been really engaging. And uh, I've been actually wondering if uh, 
you know, spaces where big objects or something other than big objects, you know, and uh, whether partial, like tacit knowledge of space might be essentially different from the knowledge that we have about, you know, the handy things that objects are. And where is body in it? Like, uh, how does body and mind switch between partial uh, knowledge, a tacit knowledge and a complete conceptual knowledge of things that are sort of pre-given in their design handiness? So this is pretty much the question. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I know if you think of um, Paul Preciado's work, uh, which started out in architecture, interestingly enough, uh, and the architecture of, we talked about desire earlier, architecture of desire is the other side of post-war modernity. Uh, but then, um, because of, and that's uh, Preciado's book, Pornotopia, and the book after that, uh, changes scale, and it's much more about the hormone. Uh, so how does one think the body in relation to uh, kind of what one immediately experiences as objects and forms, but are really kind of practices and artifacts of, um, you know, sort of planetary infrastructural procedures, like that side strikes me as interesting. I, I thought that occurs to me a little bit is, is architecture's got writers now, right? And a lot of built form, not from architects at all. Uh, like a lot of built form is built, is financially engineered for anything else, so there's that side of it. And a lot of it is engineer engineered, you know, like engineering put over the chunks of what architects used to get to do. So yeah, like think, yeah, how do you kind of position in relation to those things? I've been sort of stressing a sort of collaborative, comradely model of knowledge, but there's also disciplines in spaces and, you know, like mm -hmm. to kind of hold your corner a little bit, right. a little bit literally in this case. Yeah. yeah, no, that is interesting for architecture in particular, I think, and it reminds me of Keller Easterling's mm -hmm. metaphor, right, where she always says, you know, architecture, as we tend to think about it as a question of form, is this kind of precious stone in a river where, like, all the rest of the built form is being, like, pushed out through a fire hose, you know, <laughs> and yeah. uh, so, you know, she talks about how we need to be realistic about that position within this onslaught of these kinds of massive infrastructures, yeah. et cetera. But I think for me, it also goes back then though to this question of architecture as a knowledge, because I think what architectural um, thought can provide is a way of seeing that mm. form, even yeah. if we don't yeah. make it. Yeah. And, and maybe as we transition architectural knowledge and knowledge making and the production of architecture itself, for me, in terms of an architectural pedagogy, I keep thinking back to emphasizing perhaps this question of, of seeing. And I think that that's something that maybe architects can provide um, because of our training, right? Mm -hmm. It's something we can build up off of our training that is actually different from other mm -hmm. disciplines. And you know, an architect and an engineer will look at the same thing very, very, very differently. But I think architecture, because it always has been you know, operating at several intersections, maybe has the capacity to uh, do that act of seeing in a complex way that adds something to the conversation and that perhaps we can kind of layer on also some speculation in a way that, you know, we can start to imagine things otherwise as well in that kind of intersection of different knowledges and, and the act of seeing. Yeah, I, like my image for that is is like laminating, you know, with a, yeah, if you look at that, like laminated wood, the layers are different and that's yeah. sort of why it works, you know, it's, it's like, a, like the cross grain, for example, or different kinds of wood or something like that. And, most fields of knowledge don't laminate very well, you know, like economists think one way. Yeah. Um, but what I love that architecture is like economics, economics can be one of its layers. Right. But you might then also have uh, the engineering layer and the aesthetic layer and the understanding building regulation layer and understanding how to talk to contractors layer, you know, like I think right. that's to think of it as a sort of interstitial practice, but then which layers have to change and which layers have to change when might be one way of thinking. Mm. Um, the history of architecture will differently as well, rather than as a sort of succession of styles, which is how I was taught it. Right. How are architects going to engage in with being able to laminate different uh, conferences and disciplines at different times? You know, um, when did understanding of metal space frames become a thing that architects, you know, because there's a moment for that one, it wasn't. 
Right. And this this building is one of the big, you know interstitial moments. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. this is an example. Right. Right. It looks like a stone building, but it ain't. Right. Mm -hmm. Lots of surprises on the interior. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Great. I know, um, first of all, thank you. Uh, I, I personally really appreciate the, the extent which you address the issue of, of uh, transition in, in different levels, different sectors, and so on. I think it's very interesting. Uh, I would, it's more just like a thought than, than a question. I know this. Um, and this relation between building and uh, body and metabolism is, in fact, something that is, in terms of the archaic, persistent in architecture, the, 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 the analogy of the body, the metaphor of the body, and so on. And, and for me, it, it's strange because in that recently, you know, maybe in the last, uh, maybe from the sixth section, I'm sorry, to be able to incorporate the body into a Territory that has demonstrated to be completely artificial, nothing natural. There is a transformation actually of metabolism into a language that has to do with production, consumption, waste, and so forth. Hmm. And and I was just wondering what what uh, what you think about that uh, because there's a kind of very diagonal relation with the issue of Earth and, and human life on Earth, right? And what was said about the Bandage around the globe, right? Earth is doing fine. It's just we, we are in trouble. You know, Earth is going to transition into a different state that maybe is going to be totally unsuitable for us. As you said, maybe jellyfish will work much better. And, and I think this, this abandoning uh, pure speculation, the this kind of naturalist analogy that the body always offers for protection, kind of legitimation that is a naturalistic one, even if it's we lived then in a kind of industrial technological mode with again, as I said, energy consumption, waste, and so on. But maybe a way also to put that. Meaning, maybe we should think that we are we are producing things that are not natural. Mm -hmm. They have a different set of problems, which are essentially defending us from a transformation which is absolutely that of natural, which will get rid of us. Uh, and uh, so I don't know, I just keep thinking about Yeah, I, I think it's helpful because I think what I'm trying to do is, uh, all right, what if we held on to the metabolism as the sort of um, conceptual uh, parallel between built form and the body, but without nature? Uh, so there's nothing natural about either. Uh, so the naturalism of the body doesn't anchor the naturalism of built form at all. And the uh, example of uh, first example of the denaturalized body is the trans body, but really all bodies are like that. Like all bodies are held together by uh, interventions of one sort or another that uh, make the application of the category of natural arbitrary and politicized. Like to say this is the natural state is usually a political gesture above all else. Uh, so I think that was sort of where I was headed with that. And then uh, trans bodies and sort of interesting, useful, maybe uh, example, precisely because it has to transition, like you have to modify it. And there's a period of instability. Uh, and then you're looking for a way to restabilize it around a different, uh, sort of oscillate around some different norms um, to think, may, maybe one could think that uh, that would be a period of um, transitioning um, built form. Uh, and then the third part be to think uh, the, what's the analogy of the hormone in the body specifically? And that's got to do with information and signaling with what, what it is that regulates. So how the body regulated. And it need not be, we don't have to think of its regulation as natural or unnatural, but it is regulated. You know? uh, what regulates uh, built form in place of a kind of um, uh, sort of unidirectional commodification that I think we're seeing is not going to last very long. So I think that would be, you know, teasing some things out of, as you say, a long history of, of those images, in ways you could make this um, cultural inheritance to some specific work in the present. I wonder also if um, 
you know, bringing up this question of nature and how we sort of tend to naturalize things and problematizing it is very important because I think in the framework where we say, you know, all of this is natural and we'll all just, you know, I'll die out and we'll all just be jellyfish. Um, I think that there, the problem with that is that it begins to then naturalize this process of extinction, which, you know, in many ways that we still have to accept culpability for it, even if we don't want to see ourselves as outside of natural processes anymore. Um, I worry about the moments where uh, sort of naturalizing means then this kind of acceptance of the mass destruction that we're that we're perpetrating. Um, and so I, I recently read an essay by Benjamin Bratton where he was talking about um, our computational systems. He describes them as telluric intelligence, meaning that like they emerge from the earth because we make computers with earth materials. And so even as we think of like the most artificial things that we make, let's say the digital world, you can still look at those and root them in the earth. They come from the earth. You simply have manipulated sort of things to get it to kind of interact in different ways. Um, so I, I think in many ways, like it keeps coming down to the question uh, which you raise in your writing, uh, which is sort of like, as we look at this world in front of us, it's a question of like, what's worth salvaging and what's not. That of course becomes a really thorny question. It's like, I mean, it's built, with, it built in with so many questions of power. I and mean, so I don't know the answer to it, but, um, just thinking about the, like how complex and maybe frightening it is that we come to a moment where we even have to make those kinds of decisions. I mean, Tim Morton proposed, we try to think ecology without nature, mm -hmm. useful thought experiment. I kind of think the reverse in uh, like the red, which is nature without ecology. Like, what, what if there's no necessity for, um, actually for it to be metabolic to the state yeah. that, that uh, its stability is always temporary. Right. Um, but the, you know, Rem Glynn said nature is one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language. And you got to love that he said two or three, you know? uh, because it means something in its opposite at the same time. Like, like nature means the opposite of the human, but nature also means that which includes the human. Uh, so it has this ambiguous double sense. Uh, so we, we're forever, you know, like caught in that play. Uh, everything artificial is then also necessarily natural in one meaning, and in another meaning, it's not. Okay. So it's it's sort of like a dual concept to make work. Yeah. And its and its use is nearly always political. Like nature rather than God is what legitimates order. Right. Okay, we should probably start wrapping up. Are there any final questions? Thank you. Referring back to his question and also his response, but um, you were saying that the motivator, the catalyst transition for architecture being necessity isn't part of the issue in response to what we talked about here, class as well. Isn't part of the issue that within capitalist society, it's the drivers of architecture are no longer mainly the architects, it's more about. Whether it be the developers, the owners, like the images of the world and you show the people that are affecting change are not the ones affected by you know, the other the ones who lost their homes or the ones who sit comfortably and observe. And so the necessity of that they will feel or that they'll experience is not going to be the same that will affect that change that I guess needs to happen at the mm -hmm. scale that it does. So yeah, it's not a question of hopelessness, but like what you see as needing to happen for, I guess it would be more the end of a world type of conversation where it's a shift in that paradigm, but what what would that look like if that were to happen or how would that manifest? No one has any idea, right? Is the yes. So the last one, right? And I'm, I'm suspicious of people who think they know. Uh, I'm struck though, but like maybe the, the instances where architects seem to be like sovereign over what they're building are exceptions or maybe illusions. Uh, like when are architects ever the person in charge? Uh, that's maybe that's kind of a myth. Um, I mean, um, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water is a masterpiece, but like Kaufman was just this crazy patron. Uh, who let him do it, you know, like it's an it's exceptional in that sense. It's not the norm. Uh, I went on a tour to see uh, Falling Water that includes another 
Frank Lloyd Wright with a much less accommodating patron. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, oh yeah, that's one of his tip homes where it's in, in the wrong place on the side. Like it's in the wrong place because the patron wanted it there, you know? Uh, and that's a little closer to the north. It's still the freaking right building. So the corridor is two foot wide. You know, it's still got it's just nonsense. Um, but most buildings are more like what you see around. Yeah, it was designed by the client. And by designed financially and designed by regulation. And yeah, so uh, the thing architecture is responding to necessities, but where those necessities are going to change, um, you know, what happens when clients start um, asking about those things that might get interesting? Why has insurance companies just refuse to let anybody build this stuff because they would be on the hook for it? You know, like that's real and already happening in some places yeah um what happens when um whatever state agency is control of the land has to acknowledge some of it doesn't exist anymore which is where louisiana is already yeah so i think that necessity is going to come around yeah. yeah i totally agree and i think in many ways it goes back to like well what are when those necessities arise mm -hmm. what ideas do we have as architects, because that right. we're never in right. charge, but people still ask us for ideas sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Not always, <laughs> but sometimes. And the hope is that perhaps we can position ourselves more in this time. And I think that's why I really like your framework of pain and texture as this question of like, well, what are the questions that we are asking ourselves as we think of ourselves as making something, right? And then you position yourself kind of relative to any number of things that can come your way, but when they do, there's a kind of agility maybe or like a, a nimbleness that we try to cultivate which I think um, is not about like necessarily saying okay now we are trying to reinstitute ourselves as the people in charge but rather to recognize the role that we do play in giving form to the built environment and then really trying to like basically uh, take that space and do with with it what we can um, with all with the recognition of, of all of the problems that that I think about it. How, how do you align um, what needs to change with uh, professional opportunities to be ready to get some, you know, better than random answers? Yeah. When whoever does get to put their imprint on necessity wants them uh, to be able to say, well, like the engineers don't have an answer and your financial model doesn't have an answer, but maybe we can build this and it might work. Right. And there's also the role of paper architecture, you know, in yeah. a way that yeah. our, like architecture also is cultural production, right? It's not only the form, it also embodies ideas about how we live and how we live together or, or even how we don't and how we separate people from each other, right? Every architectural proposal has that capacity to separate or bring together no matter if it's convention or not, yeah. I, I love that stuff, you know, but <laughs> I don't have to build actual things, so I mean. <laughs> Okay, well, if there are no longer any questions, oh, one last one. Um, when somebody over here asked uh, a desire for transition, you expressed more as a need for transition. So I was wondering um, how would you express or how would you try to explain that need? I was thinking that it could be um, either a material imbalance, uh, which then when it is balanced produces new forms, so there's transformation. Uh, it could also be an ontological um, incongruence between uh, an exterior and interior, uh, which again is solved and produces new form, or something that is basically informed by an exterior form uh, that when adapted to an interior form also produces a, a Body, which transformation. So I was wondering if, if it's maybe something like that, or if you have a, another way of thinking this need for uh, transition. Yeah, I, I just wanted to avoid uh, a language that's co-opted by psychoanalysis, specifically talking about uh, the the need trans people have to transition. Uh, I, I don't think it's well modeled as a desire. Uh, at all, but it, it's it's you know experience is a need, um, and experienced physically. Uh, so to think it more as kind of rooted in material necessity, uh, and then how how then analogously is is built form uh, 
something driven by need experienced as material physical necessity uh, that would be the the thought there yeah uh, you know i can't uh, i i sent a note to the super of my building this morning that the front door is not closing properly uh, it's like my need is you know the the freaking front door lock uh because we've had this before and random people walk into the hallway you could punch a hole through the wall into my apartment. You know, it's like really just a piece of plywood. So the need here is physical security, you know. Uh, so it, like it's not a desire on my part. Uh, it's a need for that not happen. Again. <laughs> I think that we can call it a call it a day. Thank you so much for thank you for having me. Thank you.